I'm Christos from Greece. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to talk about D-Trace, uh, more specifically a subsystem I created for tracing arbitrary instructions in the kernel. Now, how many of you have experience with D-Trace? Okay, so I don't think I should spend much, much time explaining what it is. So for those, of, uh, so for those that don't have much experience, D-Trace is a dynamic tracing framework. So basically you can ask the kernel questions about its state in real time. It originated in Solaris in 2005, and it's been ported some year in FreeBSD. And so some, uh, uh, what do you call it, like some uh, keywords in D-Trace, like provider is a basically a kernel module that does a specific task like tracing uh, the entry point of a function or a syscall. And a probe is that specific point of, of instrumentation, like the, could be an instruction or a syscall, as I said. So D-Trace works in a, in a language called D. You're probably familiar with it. Some kind of uh, C and awk uh, language. And if you want to read more about it, because D-Trace is huge, you can just go to this website. It has lots of cool uh, examples. So, uh, how, how many of you have experience with FBT? Okay, so FBT uh, traces the entry and return point of a function. I, here I have an example. You, you give it, we, we want to trace, for example, the entry point of malloc. So every time malloc enters, uh, dtrace spits out a message that we hit an entry, and I also print which program uh, entered malloc. So the thing with dtrace is that, uh, with FBT is that it cannot trace inline functions or yeah, basically inline functions and it's something quite useful to have. So for this, I created a new provider called Kienst. So Kienst stands for, I guess, kernel instruction tracing maybe. And it was inspired by FBT. And, but in contrast to FBT, w which traces only max to two instructions in a function, the enter and return instruction, FBT can trace any instruction. So <coughs> this is useful because inline functions are not easy, not, not easy. No, you need to be able to trace any instruction in a function in order to put probes on inline functions. So being able to trace arbitrary instructions gives more fine-grained tracing. Like if you know in assembly where an if statement starts, you can put a probe there, and if every time an if statement fires, uh, hit, you hit the if statement, detrace prints out a nice message. You can also do that for loops, branches, or any instruction, really. But the thing is that it requires good C to assembly translation skills. I, I don't have, I haven't had time to create like very high level tools to translate C lines maybe to assembly instructions. So that's a project for the future maybe. And uh, Kins is available for AMD64, ARM, and RISC-V. And here below is where you can find the code base. So these are a few examples of the three kinds of syntax you can have in Kienst. So you can have just a function and leave the uh, probe field empty. And that means that we want to trace every instruction in that function. So here in this example, we trace all instructions in AMD64 syscall. And it says it matched four, uh, 458 probes, which are mostly or almost all instructions. Um, you can also specify specific instruction, but in order to find which instruction you want to trace, you probably want to uh, enter GDB and disassemble a function and find the exact offset. So you see this plus zero, plus one, plus four. You give it a function and that offset and then it traces that instruction. And you can also print registers. So, and then we have inline function tracing, which is the syntax similar to FBT. So you give it a, an inline function and an entry or return keyword as a probe field. And here it traces the critical enter function, which is inline. And <coughs> you see it matches 130 probes, which means 130 uh, copy, uh, inline copies that is found in the kernel. And so you see spin lock enter, every, basically every function 
the critical enter is being inlined in. <coughs> so this talk is more going to be more about high level ideas and not really very low level technical stuff. So uh, I want to talk about three things. Basically how instructions are instrumented because it's quite different from FBT. H what uh, obstacles I found in creating uh, different ports, the AMD, RISC V and ARM ports, and how inline function tracing works because I guess that's probably the most interesting thing. So as is the case with um, most uh, DTrace providers, uh, Kinst uses a uh, device file under dev DTrace Kinst. And when you type the command, the DTrace command, say the script, probe information uh, is sent to that device file and libdtrace sends that to Kinst and Kinst does. Get, uh, disassembles the function that we requested, say we want to trace first instruction of malloc. Ginst finds mal uh, the linker information for malloc, it, it disassembles it, finds which instruction is the first one and puts a probe there. And um, then the original instruction is overwritten with a, a breakpoint one and we save the original instruction, say a push RBP instruction. We save that to a buffer and we can restore that when uh, we close dtrace. So when the CPU hits the breakpoint, we enter as always the trap handler and there, there are various dtrace hooks and depending on, uh, we enter, basically we enter the Kinst uh, trap handler that essentially traces the instruction. And so as far as those, uh, this, uh, second to last point is concerned. I'm not gonna talk about it now. Maybe you will see why later. So this is essentially the, I'd say flow chart of how Kinst works. So up here we have dtrace command. It's, it's, it's sent to libdtrace and we send an IO control to Kinst. And Kinst creates, pr creates the probe. It overrides the original instruction with a breakpoint so we can trace it. And uh, so here, this, table, say this is a function like uh, on the stack and s say this could be malloc for example and it has a bunch of instructions and we want to trace this instruction. So Kins replaces with a breakpoint and a each time the kernel, the CPU, uh, hits that breakpoint, we enter the breakpoint handler, we enter dtrace and we enter the Kins. And so Kins does some stuff and we continue execution. And that could, we could also have like breakpoint few instructions down the road and we do the same thing. Um, so, wait, yeah, so how exactly we trace an instruction is essentially quite different from FBT because, so FBT, the way it traces an instruction is it does this overriding with the breakpoint and when we hit the breakpoint, FBT basically emulates that instruction. But because FBT traces only the return and uh, the entry and return points, it, can all, can, it is not very hard to emulate f two or four instructions. So, but with Kins, we might have thousands of instructions that, and for three architectures, that's actually thousands of instructions. So uh, emulating every single instruction is, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't wanna do that. And also it's very easy to get wrong. So to trace an instruction, in Kinst, what m most of the time happens is we use a trampoline, basically a block of memory somewhere else that we transfer execution to and we execute the, the original instruction there. I guess most of you are familiar with trampolines, yeah? I have, uh, I have slides about that. So, so exactly uh, his question was how do we, how, so say an instruction uh, addresses uh, some place in memory relative to the PC, like the program counter. Now, if we copy that instruction to somewhere else in memory, the trampoline, now that also no longer is correct. So we'll, there has to be some modification. And that also causes a problem on, on, uh, with how we get back from the trampoline. So we en enter Kinst, we transfer execution to a block of memory somewhere else, and now we have to return back. Otherwise the kernel will crash. So 
to uh, some technical information maybe for those that care. Trampoline, as I said, executable block of memory and each trampoline is, uh, we, we have, uh, it uh, Kims has what is called, uh, I like to call it chunks maybe. So each chunk is a uh, size page size and there's basically a list of chunks that uh, we, uh, and each chunk is divi logically divided into smaller trampolines. So each chunk has, say, 32 trampolines, and each trampoline has the original instruction. And, and there's here, like, functions that are used to allocate memory via map find, with execute, obviously, via map remove. Um, <coughs> yeah. So this is a uh, layout of a chunk, we have the chunk, and here we have trampolines inside each chunk. And each trampoline contains the instruction, obviously. And depending on the architecture, this will be fixed. Thi this, uh, this will not remain like that. So depending on the architecture, you, after the instruction, you might execute a breakpoint or a far jump. I'll talk later about why. So in AMD64, we have, so each trampolines are per thread and per CPU. So they're essentially rewritten every time we execute a probe. So w we have, say, two probes, w uh, one probe for first instruction of malloc and one for the second. First time we hit the breakpoint, we fetch a trampoline, copy the instruction there, we transfer execution, do all kinds of stuff, and return back. And then we do the same for the second probe. So this is not really a smart approach. It is proven to be quite buggy when running VMs. So a ARM and RISC-V use one trampoline for each probe. So this is the control flow of AMD64, as I said, to be deprecated. So we have the instruction, we hit the breakpoint, as I said earlier, trap handlers. And so what KINS does is it, uh, if, if we have um, uh, PC relative instructions, uh, we have to first of all modify the offsets. So if uh, uh, there was a move that referenced some memory relative to RI the re RIP register, we have to re-encode that offset. And then we copy that instruction to the trampoline. We set the RIP to the trampoline, execute it, and return back. And far basically do a far jump back to the next instruction. And for ARM and RISC-V, which is the mechanism that AMD64 is going to have soon, this is the control flow. We we enter the winner kinst and we decide, okay, has this probe already fired? So if it doesn't, if it hasn't fired yet, we, so there's the no case, we say the state, basically interrupts, uh, any registers we might care about, and we, disab we disable interrupts as well. We set the PC to the tr trampoline, we transfer execution there, and if you see, we execute a breakpoint after the original instruction. So that breakpoint basically goes back to the trap handler and we re-enter KINS because it was called by KINS. And now this, state, uh, this probe has fired, so we enter the other case where we restore state in, and interrupts and we continue execution. Now, this seems quite more complicated, but it's not. And yeah, and synchronization, yeah, here. Synchronization is done through a per CPU state structure, basically, where we, we say it's, it's, each CPU could be uh, tracing one instruction at a time. So if we're tracing an instruction, we disable interrupts, save current state, execute, uh, trace the instruction, and restore the state. So a few problems with this. AMD64, well, has a complicated ISA, as most of you know. <laughs> so parsing instructions, because you need to do some par parsing to some extent. It's quite tedious and l very error prone. Um, RIP relative instructions, as I said, have to be re-encoded every time you copy them to the trampoline. Call instructions have to be emulated uh, because uh, have, you have to be emulated in assembly. For some reason, you cannot do that in C because you have to uh, increase the stack size, uh, make a reserve space in the stack. That's not possible in C. Here's the file if you wanna, uh, the, the BP call label, if you wanna see how that's done. And in ARM and RISC-V, 
um, you cannot really encode, uh, you cannot re-encode uh, uh, offsets relative to the trampoline because that trampoline is believed quite far from the original instructions, so you'd have to use more than one instruction in order to encode a, a large offset. And th since that's not possible, we sadly have to emulate those instructions. So for risk five, I don't remember like off the top of my head which instructions there are. Possibly the j branch instructions, for example, you have to emulate them, but they're quite relatively easy to do. Uh, and, some, and some functions and instructions are completely safe to trace. So we cannot, for example, trace um, instructions that, atomic instructions, for example, or general instructions that are very, very low level. We cannot uh, mess with them. So the man page, I think, yeah, the man page lists all the instructions and functions that are not safe to trace. So <coughs> inline function tracing, this is the syntax. Oh, there is a return missing here. Uh, and all inline tracing is basically done in libd trace. Now, what I mean by that is that uh, libd trace uses the dwarf. Have, you, has, have any of you experience with dwarf? Well, good. And elf. Basically, dwarf is a debugging standard that's used by compilers, GDB, and it contains all sorts of information, file lines, uh, say, uh, uh, locations for variables, functions, uh, function references, everything. But parsing this is very, 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 very slow. Like tracing an inline function can s could take up to 10 or 20 seconds in hardware or a minute in VM. <laughs> so if anyone wants to make libdwarf faster, that's, that would be great. So when we request, when we enter inline tracing mode, which is basically calling kins with an entry or return offset instead of a number. That uh, libd trace uh, basically starts parsing all loaded kernel modules to see, okay, is this function really an inline one? And if it is, um, uh, libd trace finds the boundaries that each, uh, I I for each inline copy basically, we find the exact boundaries where it starts, where it ends, and we through, through a few calculations, we basically get the exact offset and the function that inline function is being called at. And we, libdtrace essentially creates normal kins probes. Say, critical enter is called from malloc at offset two. Libdtrace will find that and it will create a kins probe at malloc offset two. So that saves a lot of kernel computation, basically. That would be quite painful to do. And as I said, this is done for each kernel module, so slow. And if the function is not at the inline, I mean, we could ask, for example, kinst to trace malloc. Malloc is not an inline function, so in that case, libdtrace just converts that probe to FBT1 to avoid duplication in the code. This can also have nested inline functions, or at least as I, as I have tested so far, it can. And I've written a few articles on my website if you want to read more about the technical details of that, how this is done. <coughs> so basically, if we have an inline function, inline function, say this is a script that we want to trace this inline function. This is the initial script. We gave it the name of the function, and we want to trace the entry point. And libdtrace converts that to that, which is something that Kins can understand. And if it's not an in inline function, as I said, just convert to FBT. So the dwarf, as I said, you should not learn it, probably. And uh, dwarf works by saving debugging information into a tree. So we have a compilation unit at the top of a tree, say a file, and each leaf is a function, a, its variables, and all that, all those things. Um, yeah, and uh, functions that get inlined uh, have a certain, so each uh, entry in the tree has certain attributes, say, it's, as I said, it's location or, well, location, name, a file that is being called from, and it also might have an inlined 
attribute. So when libdtrace does uh, parses the tree, it says if it sees that we it, that we match both the name and the inline attribute, we know that okay, we have an inline function here. So it starts it starts searching for specific uh, for individual copies and uh, copies are stored in different entries and they they point to the declaration declarations entry offset and they also include that the lower and upper boundaries so libdtrace provides all of that it's just very very slow to implement and here is an example of what it tree an entry looks like for an inline function uh, this is a declaration entry so this could be stored in a header file basically and w you see here we have the uh, inline attribute so libdtrace sees that and later down the road it might find a copy so this copy points to we know that this copy basically points to this function because here the abstract origin attribute happens to be the same as the address of that uh, <coughs> the address of the declaration so we know that these two match and here we have the low PC which is the uh, beginning address and the offset to for the end address we get those two, and with those two we basically have the boundaries so I know this sounds quite complicated but <laughs> I certainly got lost uh, so how to to calculate uh, the specific offsets we need uh, as you've seen here we have the entry offset of the inline function we have the return offset we add that to the low PC obviously and we get the return offset and so we know that the uh, wait let me read it from here it's worded better <laughs> uh, yeah so leave detrace when it now it knows the entry and return offset of the inline copy but that doesn't really give us much information about which function this is from because as as I said Kinst needs to know the parent let's say function in order to create probes I mean we know this we know this offset but we don't know which function is being called from so to do that uh, we, we need to scan elf symbol tables which is not it's also quite complicated but <laughs> so we, we scan the table and <coughs> we basically try to see okay so elf store for each each symbol it has an entry and return address so since we know the inline functions entry and return addresses we see that okay are those addresses inside that symbol so I wrote this quite very very smart looking uh, uh, formula like if we find that the upper and lower boundaries of the inline function are inside a null symbol it, it is probably the function we're looking for and then we can get its name because we're already parsing that symbol and we also get their entry and return offsets using those calculations which are, are simple and now that was it thanks to Mark Johnson obviously for helping me and Mitchell for uh, helping with the risk five port. And if you have any questions or those questions out here, have any has, have any of you used Kinst? <coughs> no. So still quite experimental and low level. So I'd love to hear feedback if any of you ca cares about using it. So any questions? Yeah. This one. Yeah, so the problem is that you mean uh, execute, what? Oh, he asked, uh, why do we need two traps? Basically one for the, this one, the original trap from the instructions, and why do we need this one as well? A trap from the trampoline, is this what you're asking? So, uh, ARM in risk 5 it's not possible to encode a far jump in a, a single instruction. So there's some, 
we have to find some way to break out of the trampoline and return to the original instruction. And so trampoline, uh, having another breakpoint to get into Kien's and restore the state and manually go to the next instruction seems to be the best way I found so far. No, we first need to execute the trampoline. So we transfer the execution there, and we execute, say, the push instruction. Then we execute the breakpoint. We enter, we re-enter Kinst, and since we know that, okay, now we trace the, the probe, we just restore the state and exit. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, that. No, so, yeah, I mean, it could, ha it could happen, but it would make trampolines way bigger. So, yeah, I mean, that's a solution I haven't really thought of. I need to test to see if it, it could potentially break things. For example, if you encode uh, bar jumps inside the trampoline. I, I'm not sure, so, yeah? So in other words, you, you need to use a breakpoint instruction because you uh, have more access to breakpoint than you have hardware breakpoint. But could you in the breakpoint instruction itself restore the code and set a menu access breakpoint for the instruction? Wait, I'm, not I'm not sure I understand, can you repeat? So, can you show me like after, after the after the talk how how this could be done? I, I will show you like the code how it works. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm not really aware of that, but yeah, having just a, sec a second breakpoint seemed to be simpler. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the <laughs> most yeah, uh, qualified, yeah. Uh, and the question I'm going to here is why are kernel pages containing code sent to a separate file system to be scanned by the other system? Why can we write into the kernel? Wait, no, no, I, I, think, I, I think I skipped that uh, before. Yeah, so chunks live above the kernel base. Yeah, but you're replacing a session in a oh. Oh, that's how G-Trace works. I mean, all, all providers do that. FPT does the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah? questions? No? Okay. Thank you.